Our next presenter is Rick Clark. Now Rick has truly been farming for the future as he is a fifth generation farmer. His family has been living on his land and farming his land since 1880. And as a grandfather himself, Rick is able to pass down 7,000 acres and a no-till philosophy. As Rick is the 2022 National No-Till Innovator of the Year, previous keynote speaker at the 2019 National No-Till Conference, and he was featured on the cover of No-Till Magazine. Rick has been influential for farmers, not only for these no-till methods, but also for emphasizing crop diversity and non-GMO seeds. In 2016, when Dannon announced that it would transition its products to non-GMO verified, Rick Clark had already transitioned to all non-GMO seeds for years beforehand, and he led the way and became the 2017 Dannon Sustainable Farmer of the Year. His awards go on, but in learning about Rick, what I really enjoyed, and I honor his value of Mother Nature, and in his words, diversification drives the system. Here he is, Rick Clark, founder of Farm Green Consulting, with his talk, The Benefits of Farming Green. Howdy. I am absolutely honored and thrilled to be presenting at the second annual Soil Regen Summit. Thank you for having me. It is quite the honor. All right, let's get started. Um, I like to start with this slide now because this is very important that, that we have to have the family involved. I don't like to call anybody employees. They're team members. It takes the support of everyone to be involved in this system because there are so many moving parts. There's so many things that have to change. There's so many plans that change. You tend to lose your edge. So it's very important that family members are on board. It's just, it's absolutely critical. Okay, I'm gonna dive right into the six principles of soil health. Now, most of us know what these are, but I'm highlighting these because this is so important that we minimize disturbance. And what they meant by this when they, when they came up with these principles was to minimize chemical disturbance and to minimize uh, soil disturbance. Now on our farm, we have gone all the way. We have taken away all tillage, all chemistry, all inputs of any kind, except for, for seed, of course. Um, and we are 100% are, are organic with no tillage. So uh, this is not gonna be an organic presentation, but it's gonna be a presentation that is gonna show you the benefits of the things that we can do along this curve. So um, minimize disturbance. I think it's, it's number one, and we've taken it all the way to the nth degree. Uh, maximize diversity. Cannot say enough about this. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in just an, in the next slide. So uh, let's just move on. Living roots, We've got to have living roots as many days of the year as we possibly can. Uh, I know in some instances we have uh, folks that live in northern states that that's a challenge. I, I understand that, but we have to figure out how to get creative and, and how to make it possible to have a living root as long as possible. Armor of the soil. The soil has to be protected. Um, there was a an instance this past spring in the spring of 21 where we were planting soybeans i think it was around may the second and i could not believe how warm it was for indiana it was around 93 to 95 degrees that day and we were planting into about four foot tall cereal rye and in that cereal rye i went in opened up the canopy stuck the thermometer in and it was 70 degrees Awesome. It's 95 degrees outside, 70 degrees at the four inch level down in that canopy. Not too far away, there was a little bob, the spot where the drill had a bobble and there was a little bare spot. So stuck the thermometer at the bare spot. At the two inch level, it was 110 degrees. If there were any microbes left, they were gone. They were, they were scorched. The heat just crushed them. 
It is so important to armor the soul. That's one reason. The second reason would be to limit evaporation. Once you have worked hard to build aggregate stability and infiltration rates and all of these things that you've tried to do, you want to fill that profile up when it rains. It will hold that moisture for you when the dog days of summer come. And then we've got that moisture for your cash crop to live off of when those events occur. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you have the soil armored. Context. This is very important. Um, talked to Ray Archuleta the other day. Uh, this context was, was presented uh, somewhere around 2016, I believe it was, he said. And this is so important because everything I've mentioned up to this point will work anywhere around the world but it takes context of where you are to understand what your species mix is going to be, what, what your timing of the year is going to be. Do you have the weather that will winter kill certain species or are you in a warm climate where they will live year round? It's very important to understand context. The sixth principle is livestock. Now this is not for everybody, but if you truly want to build soil health, the quickest and the most efficient way you have to introduce livestock to your operation. Again, it's not for everybody. So look for creative ways to do this. Maybe you live close to people that have livestock. Maybe you don't want to own any. So you go talk to them, see if you can't uh, bring their livestock onto your farm, get paid a rate of gain or a daily rate, whatever the, the case may be that you could work out. Maybe you have them come in on May 1st and they leave on, on August the 31st. That would be a great timing to have cattle and then take them off, move them away, get set up and get your, your cocktail in for the next cash crop. Now, if I may, I would like to add a seventh principle here, commitment. You have to be committed to do everything I'm gonna talk about today. It takes commitment. So I think it would be a great addition to this, this package of six here. Um, again, commitment. We have to have it. All right. Everything that, that we've talked about here so far is, is heading toward balance. It's a symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. I like to look at balance in a couple of ways. There's many ways to look at it. There's two ways I like to really look at it. Predator to prey. When we started down this journey 15, 16, 17 years ago, um, we, we didn't have any clue what we were doing. And we just started to work with these cover crops as a defensive mechanism because that, that's what we were up against. We were up against erosion. We had to figure out how to control erosion. So we started with a defensive approach, okay? Um, as time went on, I heard about this Haney test. We need to get some Haney testing going on. So we, we introduced the Haney test, we took samples, and the, when we got the first samples back, our system was predominantly bacterial-based. That's not good. We need to be closer to balance. So as we started to implement more and more of these soil health practices, we started to move the needle and we are now a, a fungal based system, which is exactly where I, where I want to be. We have to have the network of the mycorrhizal fungi at work and performing at peak performance because they are the communication backbone of the whole microbial biome. There's not gonna be any transaction of nutrients or minerals unless it goes through the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi network, okay? So now let's go back to the first soil health principle, minimize disturbance. This is why I put it at number one, tillage has to stop. Think about it this way, if you can get those mycorrhizal fungi to develop and thrive, and then you come through with tillage, you're just wiping out those communities. So then those communities have to rebuild themselves just in time to have you come through again and wipe them out. 
So if all they're doing is rebuilding their communities, they're doing nothing toward building soil health. This is why I put stop tillage at number one. That's one way to look at balance. Another way we look at balance, which is also on the Haney test, is predator to prey. This is important because think about when you are going to go out and target a single species or pest, you are massacring or slaughtering thousands of other beneficials. So when you make these spray, these pass sprays of a pyrethroid or some kind of insecticide, this is what you're doing. You are sending your system out of balance. I get asked all the time, how can you plant non-GMO corn without any insecticide? It's because we are close to balance. I'm not going to say we're at balance. I don't know if we ever will be, but we are a lot closer than we've ever been. So when you have the species that preys on corn rootworm prevalent enough in your system, they will keep the corn rootworm at bay. Now, they may not stop all root feeding, but they will stop it to the point where it's not going to alter yield, okay? So balance, it's all about heading toward balance. All right, diversity. I think there are three ways to look at diversity. Number one is multiple species cocktails. Now, when you get started, if you're a new person to this concept and you get started, you should heed this advice. Start with one or two species that you can easily manage. It's critical that you have success the first time you try this. When we first tried cover crops, the first species we used was a single species and it winter killed. It was the tillage radish. So this is what I mean by diversity. So you started with one single species that will winter kill. And as you become comfortable and become more willing to try new things, you add more species to your cocktails. So maybe year two, three, four, you're up to four, five, six species. Then as time evolves and moves on, you are now up to pushing the limit and you're 16, 17, 18 species. That's what I mean by diversity. We need to have that diversity because there are so many unknown microbes below our feet. We don't know what they want, so let's give them that opportunity. If we don't give them that opportunity, they will never thrive. So multiple cocktail species are imperative. Number two, annuals to perennials. I don't think we think about this enough. When we sit down and build a cocktail, for the most part, it consists of only annuals. Now, we have to be careful here though. We are in a system where we have taken away all inputs, everything. So I can no longer use certain perennials because I cannot mechanically terminate those perennials. But if you're in a system that still uses some chemistry, you are on this path where you're reducing chemistry, then throw the kitchen sink at it because that chemistry will still terminate those perennial plants. We need this diversity of annuals and perennials. Number three, and I think this is the future here, co-mingling cash crops. Look at this picture on this slide. Those are cold tolerant peas planted in the winter time. Uh, this was planted actually December the 1st into an existing wheat field. So now we've got all kinds of options here. Let's say you live close to a feedlot or a dairy and they need more protein. Well, that pea is going to give you more protein. So now let's say you go out and at the right time, you harvest the peas and the wheat as a wheat leach together. The dairy takes it back to a bunker. They cover it, it ferments, and now you have a high powerful protein feed source that you can add to your lineup. That's one way to look at that. Another way is to take both of these to maturity. They're going to mature within a few days of each other, harvest them together, and separate them 
uh, at the end of the day. They're very easy to separate. Another option would be spring oats and peas planted together, and those two would very easily separate. The oats are so light, use some air, you can just about blow the oats right out of the sample. So these are things that I really think we need to hone in on as diversity, because typically when you think of diversity, it's only that multiple species cocktails. We need to think about annuals, perennials, and co-mingling cash crops. Now this year, we're gonna have corn and soybeans together. I've, I have sourced some short statured corn. We're gonna harvest the two together with the grain table. And, and we're gonna have peas and corn together. We're gonna to have peas and wheat together. There are all kinds of options we can do here. We have to continue to be creative. Another picture of diversity, taking advantage of synergies. There's those peas growing in between those rows of wheat. This is awesome. We can maximize photosynthesis this way. Take advantage of the free stuff. I'm sure we're all familiar with what this is. This is the formula for photosynthesis. The energy from the sun is powerful, and folks, it is free. It is probably the most powerful energy source known to man, and it is absolutely free, so let's take advantage of it. All right, let me set this slide up. This field was a corn field in the fall. Harvested the corn, we came in, and we no-till drilled 100 pounds to the acre of Elbon cereal rye. That Elbon rye grew in the, in the fall, it maybe got four inches tall, went into dormancy, came out of dormancy in the spring, and started to grow and tiller. Now, when the rye was 12 inches tall, we went out and we measured out a 12, or I'm sorry, a two foot by two foot square and then you get scissors, shears, whatever you have, and you clip all of the above ground material off at the ground in that two foot by two foot square. Put it in a bag, overnight it to the lab, and you'll get these test results back. So I do have a slide that shows all of the nutrients that were packed into that cereal rye, but I'm trying to show here an example of why this is so important in today's time of so much crisis going on around the world. I mean, there was, a, there was a time when inputs were screaming up in price, which they still are, but you still were told by your retail plant you might get them. Now we're in a situation where you may not be able to get any inputs, and this has to be an extremely scary and uncomfortable feeling for most farmers around the world. So what we're trying to show here is the power of the rye and the reason why we let rye go far into maturity because it packs a powerful punch. It is a tremendous sequester of nutrients. So at 12 inch rye, it is sequestered 82 pounds of N and with today's current values of N, that's equivalent to $65.60 worth of N. 32 pounds of 18460, which is the equivalent of $29.12, and 133 pounds of 0060, which is potash at current values, equal to $86.45, for a total of $181.17. Now let that soak in for just a moment. 12 inch rye. Now this is probably where most rye gets terminated chemically because people are afraid it's going to get out of control. So look at what it has brought to the table already to this point. Now the thing I forgot to tell you is this field is going to be planted to soybeans. Soybeans love potash. So at 12 inch rye we've already sequestered 133 pounds. In four days, if you just would have waited on termination for four more days, look at the numbers now. So now you get to understand, see it, data is so important here, folks. You have to collect data or you can't have charts like this. And when you have charts like this and you really look them over, you now understand why people say it is difficult to plant corn, 
or yeah, I'm sorry, it is difficult to plant corn into cereal rye. Look at how much nitrogen has been sequestered by 18 inch rye in this example. It's up to 120 pounds. I do not believe in the allopathic effect that rye has on corn. I do not believe in that. I believe in the sequestration power of cereal rye that has sequestered most of the available nutrients for that young corn plant. And if you believe me on that, think about weeds in the same manner. The rye is sequestering the nutrients that the weeds need, especially the early germinating broadleaf weeds. If you come to our farm in the early spring, you will not see any broadleaf weeds because the rye has sequestered those nutrients and crushing the, those newly germinated plants. And then the rye grows and shades them out and it's game over, no broadleaf weeds. That's typically what you'll see on our farm. Now we are experiencing grass problems, but I think I have a reason or an answer for that and it's coming up in just a moment. So now we're at 28 inch rye and look at these numbers now. It's unbelievable folks what the power of this rye can do, but you've got to let this rye go. Now, 28 inches is where I stopped this particular trial. Thank goodness I had my brain hooked on and we came back and we took a dead sample two months later. Now here's the numbers I used to come up with these dollar amounts. 83 cents a pound for nitrogen and that might even be outdated. This slide was made about five weeks ago, so it may be outdated now. P at 91 cents, K at 65. So this is the power of cereal rice. So folks, I am all the way to the far end of the spectrum here. I've taken everything away. I don't expect you to do that, but meet me somewhere on this curve. Grow cereal rye, let it go all the way to anthesis before you terminate and cut your potash bill in half. So if you did that, you would save a low $90 an acre with this example. And then you also have to understand this slide only was big enough to put on the three biggies, N, P, and K. There's sulfur, there's boron, there's manganese, molybdenum, there's everything out there, sulfur. All of these things were not included and they are part of this savings equation. So please take advantage of these cover crops and the power that they have. Nitrogen is all around us and it's free. We breathe 78.1% of nitrogen. So let's take advantage of it. Capture some of that free in with legumes. Same situation. Have a legume package that we plant in the fall. Now, I get a lot of comments about, Rick, I live too far north, it's too cold, we can't do it here, I understand that. But we have to get creative, okay? On our farm, our neighbors farm two crops. In our region, I'm sorry, in our region around here, our neighbors farm two crops, corn and soybeans. On our farm, we have seven crops now. Not in any particular order, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, yellow field peas, milo, and cattle. Now, with that just being said, I gave you three outs right there to get these cocktails planted in time in the fall. Cereal grain, plant a cereal grain, harvest it in, in mid-July, and do not double crop soybeans or any other crop behind it, plant a cocktail. That's number one. Number two was livestock. You can plant cocktails into the livestock while they're grazing. You don't have to just wait till they're out of that paddock. You can actually graze or plant in the paddock they're in. Now, if you're doing two hour moves, you don't have to worry about that because you can easily follow them that way or get ahead of them. They're not going to hurt that. 
Now, the third way that I haven't mentioned yet is what I call a regen year. A regen year is where you take an acre out of production because it's gotten out of step, it's out of timing, whatever the case may be, and it, you need to get it back into the system. So then you throw everything you've got at it. You start with a cool season cocktail, you build up to a warm season cocktail, and then you add the final cocktail that's going to be the setup for next year's cash crop. Those are three ways, and actually there's a fourth way for the cold, cold states up north, are these cold tolerant peas. We are testing them for the second year in a row here, where we plant these peas in the winter right before the ground freezes. So now you've widened your window by 30 to 45 days. So we've got to take advantage of these legumes. On May the 20th, 75 pounds of N was sequestered, and look at the 1846 oaf, 65 pounds. Now folks, same thing. You go out two foot by two foot square, clip everything off above ground, put it in a bag and send it to the lab. This is, this is critical to understand this. We are only doing the above ground material because I do not know how to do the below ground. I don't know where all the roots are. So I don't know how to take into account everything that's below ground. So we're not even, not even taking into account what the nodules have taken in. So this is only above ground. June 4th, look where we are now. 114 pounds of N, 122 pounds of 18460, and 267 pounds of 0060. These are outrageous numbers. Outrageous. In four days, look where the nitrogen has gone to. So again, I'm not asking everyone to do what we're doing. We no longer apply any synthetic nitrogen. We are trying to grow our nitrogen. And as you can see, if you let these cocktails go far into maturity, look at the power they have, okay? So we are now up to the big trifecta of almost $800. Rick, I don't want to plant corn on June the 8th. I'm still using some chemistry and I'm still using some synthetic fertilizers. Okay, great. Let's plant your crop, your corn crop on May 25th and let's do not terminate for at least five or six days. Now, if you are planting a non-GMO, you have to terminate before that non-GMO comes out of the ground because that Roundup will kill it. If you are still planting a GMO, time is on your side. So plant the corn on May 25th, wait a few days, and then come in and terminate and still take advantage of what we've gained here by waiting. So again, I had my brain hooked on, we went back at termination, and look at in six weeks, look at almost everything has been exhausted here. Now we know that not all of this is available right now. We know that. So let's take half of it. So that's what I'm asking you to do here. Plant your corn on May 25th, wait till June the, the 6th or 7th, and let's assume with just interpolation here, there's somewhere around 240 pounds of available in. So take half of that credit. What was that 120 pounds? 120 pounds for easy math, uh, I know I've got here in at, at 83 cents, but I can't do that math in my head. Let's assume it's a dollar a pound. That's $120 an acre you're going to save in synthetic inputs. And by the way, the way things are going now, you may not be able to get all of the in that you need. So in the future, you may be only able to get half or two thirds of what you want. So all the more reason to have these cocktail packages working for you, the power of that free nitrogen. Epigenetics. Heritable phenotype changes that do not involve alterations in the DNA sequence. I'm gonna read that again. Heritable phenotype changes that do not involve alterations in the DNA sequence. This is where we are headed on this farm. I have about 17 more tries at this, this farming. And I'm gonna make these last 17 count. I'm focusing in on two things. I'm focusing in on epigenetics and I'm focusing in 
on things that turn that stimulate and turn on certain sectors of microbes. I don't mean adding microbes to the system. I'm talking about adding stimulants, finding out what these stimulants are, and introduce stimulants to turn on certain microbes. Now, right now, I want to talk about epigenetics. We've already started doing this. We have gone back to the, to the USDA seed bank, and we've gotten seeds that, were, that are off patent, and anyone can use now. There are no, no rights here that are gonna be broken. They're off patent. We gathered 10 varieties of soybeans off patent. We are growing them out. We now are up to 2,000 pounds of each one, and they will be now planted in our system in a position to where we are going to harvest them and start keeping our own seed and making those heritable phenotype changes within our system. Because I am convinced that current varieties and hybrids have lost their association with the mycorrhizal fungi. And this is very, very critical. If the current genetics are losing these associations with the microbial biome, that means those genetics are going to be solely dependent on synthetic inputs. That is not good. Now, with that also being said, you can understand why I'm stressing epigenetics because current genetics are not going to work in our system because we are the exact opposite. We are no tillage and no synthetic inputs. These phenotypic trait changes may result from external or environmental factors or be part of normal development. Why in the world wouldn't we be keeping our own seed year after year after year? Now remember, listen to what I'm saying. You cannot do this with current genetics. You're breaking the law. You have to go back and find genetics that are off patent. Now, epigenetics with seed, I, we're going to do this with corn, we're going to do this with beans, and we're going to do this with our cover crops. We're starting to save our own cereal rye now. We're going to create epigenetics with cereal rye. Our cereal rye is going to adapt to our system. I think the same thing holds true for the microbes. Epigenetics within the microbe community. It is real. These same microbes are going to adapt to our systems and thrive and give us all of those things that we need. Epigenetics, I think it's, it's coming. I think it's real. I think it's something worth looking at. Input reductions. All right, I went back from, to 2011 and I came forward to 21 and I looked at how much we've, we've reduced diesel fuel. Almost 50% we've re reduced diesel fuel. Now, there's two reasons why. This is number one. We've cut our horsepower from 3,350 horsepower down to 1,200. That right there in itself is a huge reduction of fuel. But the other main reduction of fuel is the fact that we no longer make multiple trips across the field. We're trying to do this system with three passes. A pass in the fall to no-till the cover crop cocktails, a pass in the spring to no-till plant the cash crop, and a pass after we've planted that cash crop with a mechanical termination. That's it. Three passes, organic, no-till. That's what we're trying to do. I, I would imagine if you were to, to bring a carbon calculator here, we are in the negative now. We have gone to the point to where a lot of companies are thriving to be by 2030, 2050, whatever the case may be. But we, in my opinion, have gone into the negative. Synthetic in, we no longer use it. Matt, no longer use it. Potash, lime, chemistry. No longer use any of these products. Now, these are all averages, folks, because I just went back across this 10-year period and in some years, we may have had a lot more corn than soybeans, and the next year, we may have had a lot more soybean than corns. 
So that's going to alter the synthetic in in one year versus another. So these are averages across that time. And now this slide shows you what those savings are worth in your pocket. Now this slide was made about six weeks ago. Things have changed again. And if anything, they've gone up. So I'm still being very conservative here. So the diesel fuel savings is 58,000. Now on the other slide, the next one was machinery. I haven't even put the what the depreciation schedule of not having that machi machinery is worth here. So that's not even included. Synthetic in, $433,000. MAP, two hundred seven, dollars $233,000. Potash, $102,000. Lime, and $316,000 worth of chemistry. Again, folks, I cannot stress the importance of collecting data. It's one thing to collect it, but then what do you do with it? You got all these pretty yield maps, but what do you do with them? You've got to do things like this. You sit down and baseline your farm. This is what every producer should be doing that's trying to think about change. Let's say you've been in a full-blown tillage system, you're fed up, you've had it, you've had a, a weather event, erosion has taken place, inputs are sky high, you're ready to pull your hair out and you just, you just wanna say it's enough, we're gonna change. Well, please, that is when you baseline show every field what you've been doing to it for as many years as you possibly can, come up with data like this, and then when you move forward, you can see if what you're doing is working or not. And then you can see where do I take more things away? And then the system is cranking and you're gonna wonder why it took you so long to get to this point. All right, when you add all of these up, that's $1.349 million. And, and that is an annual savings because we are no longer using any of these inputs. You know, I don't want to rub this in anybody's face, but folks, I've got so many things to worry about. I don't even know what the price of these inputs are because I don't have to worry about it anymore. I do need to worry about diesel fuel. I do apologize. There is one item on there, diesel fuel, I need to worry about but everything else I do not. And that is refreshing and that frees my mind up and I can think about other things. And believe me, there's a lot going on. All right, this is how I think all soybeans should be planted in the world. We need to be planting soybeans into cereal rye at boot stage and then walk away for 30 to 45 days. I mean, look, the stuff, if, as long as it's attached to the ground, it just wiggles through the planter and comes right out the backside of the planter. And you drive right through this. That, that is about boot stage. So that rye is about 38 to 48 inches tall. And, and I don't believe I, I told you exactly where I am in the world. Uh, West Central Indiana, uh, if, if you know where Champaign, Illinois is, come right into Indiana, right on the line, and then go north about 15 miles. So another way to look at it would be if you went west, I am right in line with the Missouri-Iowa border. So all of Missouri is south of me, and all of Iowa is north of me. So that kind of gets a little perspective on where you are. So typically, I mean, the, it's not a date thing. You've got to go out and scout. But typically for us, boot stage is April 27th to, or April 25th to May 5th in that time period. All right, so you come in at boot, you saw how easy we planted right through that. And folks, we have nothing special on our planter. We've taken off all no-till coulters. We've taken off all row cleaners. It's just a double disc opener and a closing system. That's all it is. Now you come back with my baby. The 60 foot I and J roller crimper. This is the baby. This is where we do 90% of our termination is right here. So we're going to roll this, this rye down and we're rolling the beans down. The beans are at V1 and a half to V2 growth stage. All this is getting rolled down at the same time. You're not going to hurt the beans. Now look over here to the right of the video. You're going to see, look at the pollen flying off. That's when you know you're out there at the right time. That pollen is flying. This is what people talk about. You plug your radiator of that tractor, and that is true. Now, 
you're not going to hurt these beans if we do this correctly. So what's, what's important to understand here is it's the timing from boot stage to anthesis, okay? The timing from boot stage to anthesis is 40 to 45 days. And the reason why this works is, is because the beans will not be beyond V2 and a half growth stage in 40 days. Because if they are, you're going to break branches and shred leaves off and probably damage the soybean. We need anthesis is critical because that's when the lignin is highest in that cereal rye plant and that roll of crimper terminates that rye. And now we've got this thatch down where we've got an armor on the soil. We're suppressing weeds. We've taken away the sunlight. This is how this works. So now the same field here, I just got out of the roller crimper tractor and I stood on ground and showed you the soybeans. Here comes the roller crimper right toward me. As you can see, there are no weeds. There's no broadleaf weeds. So there's the soybeans again. I'm going to step out of the way and boy, it was closer than I wanted it to be. The roller went right by my toes there. Now you're going to see that I'm going to step in now and we're going to look at the beans and you're going to see that the beans have not been damaged in any way, shape or form at all. So, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'll just hang on my thought here just for a moment. There's the soybeans. See, they are not damaged in any way. And look, you can see some of the thatch there from the, the previous uh, cocktail we had out there. So the thing I want to stress here is this time period from boot to anthesis. It, it's better to be later than boot stage than early because if you come in early and then you roll an anthesis, you might have beans that are too tall. And then the other thing that the beans are going to want to do if you leave them out there too long is they're going to want to elongate and stretch toward the sunlight. We've now changed their physiological structure. The first node may not be for six or eight inches off the ground now. We don't want that either. So please take heed here and stay in that 40 day window. You'd be better off to be less. You'd be better off to be 30 days instead of 50 days between planting and roller cramping. Now, we have to be flexible with Mother Nature. You never know what she's going to throw at you. This is June the 2nd. The rye is already in anthesis. So we decided to roll the rye down first and then come right behind it with the planter. So folks, this rye is done. Look at the roller. And by the way, that roller is filled with water. Every barrel there is filled with water. That rye is toast. It's over. Here comes the planter. There are rope cleaners on that planter, but they're not down. They are no longer on that planter. They're off now. And there we go, right? You can't even tell that the planter went through that rye because that's what we want. We don't want row cleaners moving that rye because now that lets sunlight come down in and guess what happens next? Weeds start growing. So we're trying to keep this as solid as we possibly can. Now on June, on July the 16th, that's the same bean field. Absolutely amazing, no inputs of any kind. So let's, let's stop right here. Rick, you know what? I'm not gonna do all those crazy things you're doing. We're not gonna go all the way where we take away all these inputs, that's great. But now, here's what I want you to do. Start eliminating glyphosate and burn down. Look at this on July 16th. There is no need for a burn down. Now you're going to go out, you're going to scout your fields, and you're going to spot spray as needed. So now I don't even know what, round, I, I've heard Roundup has gone sky high. It's like 50 or $60 a gallon. I don't remember what the rates are. So I don't know. Let's assume now by taking away the, the Roundup pass, you're saving $25 an acre. That's just a, I'm, I'm spitballing here. The point is just alone by, by eliminating that Roundup pass is the equivalent of what it costs to get this cereal rye crop out here. But now go back to my previous slide that showed the power of that rye. Think of the, all the nutrients we're bringing to the surface now to be recycled, regenerated back through the profile just by letting the rye go to maturity. Okay. I know I get excited on this, but man, when you do things like this, 
you are smiling from ear to ear and it can be done. The reason why this works, folks, is because that rye was planted on September the 10th, the previous fall. It is imperative that you get 40 to 45 days of fall growth before that first freeze comes. So I don't care what part of the world you're in. You've got to know what your freeze dates are, back up 45 days, and that's when you got to be in the field. And some of you folks are sitting there listening to this saying, well, Rick, that's August. I get it. I gave you three outs, though. Cereal grains with no, with no double crop, livestock, and regen. It can happen. It can be done. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. I do it every single day every day grow the nitrogen we need with legumes or cocktails that include each of the four categories now there is a tremendous webinar online that you need to go find green cover seed did a four-part series with dr christine jones absolutely amazing lady from australia she has one of her episodes is on nitrogen when you have completed that webinar, you will understand why you no longer need any synthetic nitrogen. We need to turn on the microbes that fix the nitrogen and maybe even add a legume or two. But it is getting to the point now where we might be able to pull this off with just cocktails that are the right species. This is very important. Plant green into living cover crops. You have to. We have to regenerate. This is what I mean by regenerate the soil. We're bringing those nutrients from deep within the profile to the surface and making them available for these cash crops again. Not only the cash crops, but whatever nutrients we brought to the surface and any that were left over after that cash crop was harvested, we now have them to help grow our next cocktail species of cover crops. So it's just a continuing cycle. We're constantly sequestering and using these nutrients. Plant beans in the 72 inch rye, we've all done it. Plant corn in the cereal rye, we can do this if we understand what's happening with the nitrogen. Now I can't do this much anymore because we are no longer using synthetic in. But if you are, you now have to bring nitrogen forward into the system to offset the sequestration that the rye has done. So once you understand that, it's okay to plant corn into cereal rye. It's okay to have 23 plants or more. In 2021, I went through the alphabet. I used every small letter there was and I started over with capital letters. Mother Nature will humble you every step of the way. So be prepared, be nimble, be quick, and do not get down because you're on plan capital D. It's okay. It's just part of what's happening right now. Park your planner no matter the date. I don't care what your neighbors are doing. If it's not fit, do not be in the field. And oh, by the way, go back to rule number one. Do I sacrifice yield to maintain soil health every single day? It might be April 25th and the sun's out shining, but if your fields are still cold, because remember, we've taken everything away, so there's no seed treatments. So the last thing we want to do is drop a naked seed down into a 48 degree environment. That's not going to work. So park your planter no matter the day. I hope to never plant corn in April again. I thoroughly love the fact that we are now planting all of our soybeans first at boot stage. And remember, for us, that's around April 25th timeframe. And we're planting corn after Mother's Day because we've got to wait for the power of that legume to fully bring everything it can to the table. And you have to do that by waiting. So it works out perfect for us. We typically have all of our beans planted before we ever crack open a pro box of corn. Plant multiple cash crops in the same field. I've already talked about this. This is going to be the future. 
totally eliminate all inputs. Now, I know that's crazy. You don't have to come with me. I would love to have the company because it's very lonely at what we're doing out here. But please meet me somewhere on this curve. Strive to eliminate half of your inputs. You're going to be shocked. You're going to find that yields don't go down, yields go up, and you've now decreased inputs and your ROI are going to be better than they've ever been before. Your return on investment. That's what this is all about. It's not about yield. This is not about yield. It's about profitability. So if we can, at the worst case scenario, if we can maintain current yields and decrease inputs by 50%, we are increasing ROI. That's what it's all about. No CFAP government subsidy payments in 2021. I am not going to stand here and be a hypocrite and tell you to take away every input there is and then put my hand out and say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Government, I'll take my free check now. I'm not doing that. I am so entrained in this system that we have. I so much believe in it. I do not want any government subsidy help. We've eliminated crop insurance four years ago. I don't want it. No longer in any government programs, no longer ARC or PLC. I do not want subsidy help. Regen acres, no cash crop. I know this is difficult to wrap your brain around. You know, people cash rent. Some people have one year contracts. Rick, how can we do? I understand all that. Please go talk to your your landlords. I think you'll be surprised at how willing they will be to flex with you and work with you and give you extended year contracts because you are now really taking care of their ground and their 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 property. It, it's no longer dirt. It's now soil. So it's it, it all comes around full circle here. They start to see your passion. They see that you're treating their acre like you treat an acre you own. I think you'll be surprised. Certified organic with no tillage, the three pass system. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away. And I mean everything. Now I know that's a bold statement and that's probably too rigid of a statement, but let's compromise and let's fall somewhere on this curve and let's come up with a definition that gets us to regenerative farming. Okay, now I want to throw in a couple slides here on the way we like to do corn. No-till planting corn into standing alfalfa. Now, just work with me here. This is part of the three-pass system I'm talking about, but obviously the alfalfa is already established. It was established two years ago. We took two cuttings off, or two years worth of cuttings to a dairy. We're now coming in, and this is where we, this is the only place on the farm where we use organic sources of nutrients. So we're going back to that dairy. We're getting either liquid manure or solid manure. And we are now bringing those manures to these alfalfa fields because when you go through two years of total removal, you cannot replace that with just cover crops. It takes additional help. Okay, so with that being said, we're now coming in and we're going to plant corn in no-till plant corn into this alfalfa. Isn't that cool? I mean, this alfalfa is probably at 50% bloom and it was 30 inches tall. I love these drone shots. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? You see green down there instead of black or brown. This is what I mean by regenerative farming. This is the epitome of it right here. Here's another video. I, I, I love both of these these drone videos, so I never know which one to use, so I just put them both in. But as you can see, with, with the wheels on the ground, the tracks of the tractor, the gauge wheels, we're already laying this alfalfa down. So look at that, you can look up each row. It, uh, some people think we've, we've gone out there and, and strip-tailed. We have not strip-tailed. That is just from the tracks of the planter the gauge wheels, the tires, etc. All right, now we then, so that, that this is the same field that I just showed you planting just, you know, uh, what, eight or nine days later. 
Now look at the look at the alfalfa to the right there of the screen. It's already starting to wilt in the daylight. Now this is V2, so the corn is about, I don't know, three inches tall or so. It's got two leaves out. We're rolling this down. Now we know this is not going to terminate the alfalfa. We know that. But we have to understand here too, folks, this is extremely risky. This is almost suicide. I'm asking you to plant a warm season grass of corn into an established perennial of alfalfa. It's almost suicide. So please don't watch this presentation and think you're going to go out this spring and all of a sudden do 600 acres of corn this way. You need to start slow, 10, 20 acres of corn and try this. Now, the reason why we're rolling this down is because I'm trying to give the corn as much of a head start as we can. It's got to get out through this alfalfa. It's got to see the sunlight and now it can take off. So as we roll this rye down, or I'm sorry, this alfalfa down, we flatten the playing field and now we've got to give the corn a chance to go. This is the reason why we're doing this at V2 because what's going to happen here in three or four days, this alfalfa wants to live. It's going to, at the end of the plants that we roll down, it's going to start to turn up and it's going to want to regrow again. Then it's competing with the corn. So this is very, timing here is very critical. Now this is the same field again. So I've showed you the planted field, the rolled field, and now the field on August the 2nd. Look at that. We've done this with no tillage. That's beautiful looking corn on August the 2nd. And folks, what happens here is once we reach canopy, the corn is going to crush the, the alfalfa. We've taken away the daylight. The corn now is pulling those nutrients hard. We're crushing that alfalfa. It's dropping leaves. It's turning yellow. It looks just like it's been attacked by weevil and it will terminate it. Unfortunately, I do not have a video to show harvest, but when we came back and harvested these fields, the alfalfa is gone. I know it's hard to believe, but we are on 20 inch corn row spacing and we're on 20 inch row soybean spacing. So we get the canopy very quickly. That same rule applies for our system. I call it the 70-30 rule. 70% of wheat suppression is done with the cover crop and 30% of the, the suppression is done with the cash crop canopy. We've got to get these cash crops to canopy as soon as we possibly can. We can do this. But again, please go slow. Small acres, get comfortable and see what happens. If you are not uncomfortable with what you are doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. Change is hard, folks. And everyone in this regenerative, sustainable, whatever you want to call it, this movement we're doing, none of us are putting down any current farming methods. That's not what this is about. We're trying to show you ways to bring maybe one or two ideas. I mean, the speaker lineup for this this soil regen summit is unreal. Take one or two pieces of information from each presentation and take it back home and incorporate those changes into your system. Change is hard, but change is also good. I challenge everyone here today to get a little uncomfortable. I think you'll like how it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am way more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative organic stewardship with no tillage. Thank you very much. It has been an absolute honor to be presenting today. Thank you. Have a great day.